All righty. Good evening out there, internets. It's uh, scuba in the uh, scuba in the ride tonight because it's Tuesday night. What up, people, peeps, everybody? Staying above float. Rain <laughs> or shine. Rain here, but shine somewhere else. Before we get too far in there, let's uh, right off the bat, let's uh, pay thanks to our recent followers, Desert Dragon eighty one. And we have Emperor 10 MI. Dag Crystal. Gary Diamonds. And uh, Jessify. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but. You hit, you hit it square uh, <laughs> on the target, but welcome all all new people. Yes, we, uh, paying paying we, thanks to our recent followers, much appreciated. Uh, click on the little follow if you're checking us out, YouTube or the uh, audio version on podcast. Give a follow, give a like, hit the bell, get notification, post the new vids, or make sure to check us out every Tuesday night here for Scuba and Rai, and then Saturdays is a uh, challenge accepted, our live D and D game. Rai, how you been, man? I've been I've been very good. Um, just uh, doing doing my thing. Uh, this is the first weekend that we could. Uh, well, I've always ventured out, but uh, this is the first weekend where we entered uh, phase one for our state. So a little more opening, a little more things to do, which is good. And it was a nice, bright, sunny weekend. So definitely ventured out to a couple places. It's a warm weekend too. Oh yeah, it definitely warm. I liked it. On Saturday, we went to a like a pseudo baby shower party from my uh, girlfriend Angelica's friend. Sunday, uh, went ahead and went to my my favorite brewery around the corner, Farmhouse Brewery, and then from there went from drinking beer to drinking orange crushes at Hot Tuna. I had to experience the sun and fun without getting a ticket. Yeah, that was a interesting thing. The governor was sitting there doing the whole phase one. Uh, on the road to reopening and going back to whatever I guess is going to be this new normal. Yep. Yep. And it's uh, whatever the new normal is, baby steps. And no matter, you know, which side of the spectrum on, you, you know, you got to work your way into it because you, you don't know what's out there. You know, you got to protect yourself, not just for yourself and your family, but everyone else around you. So I think the guidelines are doing are a good way to get back into it. We'll eventually get to some new norm. Everything is predicated on the fact that you have to get to some norm, like uh, a comment the governor had said in one of his press conferences last week. The plan is uh, the plans in place aren't just for tomorrow. They are for weeks, months, and years. We have to plan as if they won't be a vaccine. We got to get back to normal. <laughs> and that's the most truest thing I've heard a politician say. So well, it's funny. It was funny as you look at the some of the pundit stuff and looking at some of the some of the criticisms yeah. of the various governors. He seems to be. Uh, on the low end as far as criticism because he's apparently not going fast enough by some people's standards and I mean to be honest as everybody said we've never been through this kind of thing before you know our well, memory 100 years old you know so pandemic. yeah well even even so if you look even if you take a look at the Spanish flu back in the early 1900s the world was yeah. not as interconnected as it is now i mean there was still yeah. a lot of isolate isolationist type things there was still not a lot of not a lot of rapid travel or rapid population as there is now so i mean i whatever i don't know what metric they're using to base this on or what is it isn't i mean there are people who think things are taking too long there are people who think it's going too fast i mean you're never going to please anybody i think it's just going to ultimately rely down to your own individual common sense and what you feel comfortable doing, what you feel, and and what you don't feel comfortable doing. If you don't feel comfortable going out, don't go out. I mean, I went out and got a haircut today. As you can see, I'm back to my normal oh, yeah. short haired self. Haircut. That was one thing I did too on the weekend. See, a little more hair. A little, a little bit. But um, had to go in there, and of course, with these new things, is I know I go to this one place to get my haircut because all the all the uh, stylists know how to do beards, and you know I could work, I could you know spend the time to trim the beard, but you know, it's my opinion on how it looks, which I know is your own your own self voice is the important voice. But I go to this particular place and have these stylists do my do my beard trim, and I leave it to them to say, okay, based on your face, this would look good, this would not, because that happens to be the opinion. The opinion. I'm going to a professional. I want yeah. their professional opinion. I'm paying for it. 
Unfortunately, uh, because of the current phase one, they could not do anything with the beard. I had to yeah. stay. I had to sit there and wear a mask. Yeah. And it's like it sucks because it's it's like I'm sitting there and I'm wearing the mask and I put the mask on I pinch it do all that other stuff and I'm, I'm sitting there I'm, it's rising up to where it's like covering my eyes so it's like geez am I am I getting a haircut or am I cosplaying Jordy LaFord? But yeah, it's uh like you said you know everything's baby steps and you know you gotta like I said you gotta get to something you gotta lead somewhere you can't just stay hunkered down forever. <laughs> it's like I am. 100% with you because I get it. Public safety, public safety. I get it. But at some point, you just have to raise your eyebrow and go, really? Uh, so enough of, enough on that. Uh, real quick uh, announcement to get out of the way. We we thanked our recent followers. Thank you. Thank you. Keep hitting that follow. Also want to give a shout out to Sirenscape for the background music that we're hearing. We're actually going to hang out in the forest today because I think of two months of stuck in a an urban environment. Let's just get outside, listen to those listen to those birds and that wind. Change with nature. Oh, yeah. yeah. They make a wide variety of various sound sets that you can use for tabletop games, board games, D&D games, whatever. Just nice ambiance type music. Uh, we have an affiliate link in the description and the doobly-doo. Check out our affiliate link. It just lets Sirenscape know that you went there, that we sent you that way. So, awesome. Uh, Rai, do you have anything to announce? Book publishing, uh, anything like that? Uh, no, uh, just uh, slowly working through my novel, slowly reading the, the book on screenplays. So, if we don't have any other announcements, man, we're just kind of doing the what's up. You are out for the weekend. Yeah. I went out You're today. Kind of like raising an eyebrow because I was at a place that you liked. So you yeah, know, I saw that post. I'm like, I thought we were going together, man. What, 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 what's up? Together, I mean, you, know, you I, texted me and told me they were opening. They were taking reservations, and I'm like, all right, when's our reservation? Because I figured you would have done it. And it's like, nope. I guess we're gonna have to go check it out on Thursday. You're you're good for Thursday, right? As long as it's not raining. Oh, all I do right. have an announcement. I will be doing a virtual 5K this weekend. Yes. Awesome. I'm sure you'll win. Yeah, I win because I'm running against myself. So you know. <laughs> Easy win. Easy win. We're going to have a special guest. Uh-oh. You got Just a special see. guest? I got a special guest for this segment. Uh-oh. All righty. Well, reviews. Our first review of the week. Or actually, our only major review of the week is the new movie Scoob. Uh, Scooby Doo makes his 3D CGI debut. Transitioning to CGI, and our special guest is our favorite pup, Scoob. Oh, so join us for this review. Nice. Ready the review? He's ready for the review. Uh, be careful next to Kirby, though. I don't know who's yeah. got the bigger appetite. Oh no, man! Scooby snacks or suck it up. You know, whichever one works. All right. Well, with that, let's talk about Scoob. Now, this was a movie that was supposed to go to di that was supposed to release in theaters, but instead they released digitally this weekend. Yes, they um instead of uh going in theaters, which it it was supposed to be released in theaters the exact same weekend, but because of the situation, that didn't happen. So Warner Bros. decided, hey, let's go the trolls route and push it to VOD. All right. So give us uh give us your rundown and then we can talk about the things okay. i enjoyed and didn't enjoy okay uh well scoob is is it's a basic um it's a transition for this uh property scooby doo and the gang um uh, mystery inc as most people know and basically what you have here is a pseudo retelling an origin story but one that leads into your typical familiarity uh, that you know of the property. If you know the property, you have these group of kids with their dog and they go out and try to solve mysteries. So they take that familiar kind of trope that you're used to, but kind of try to modernize it within a different setting. Because what you have, I call this film a, a, a tale of two halves, two halves of a whole. And basically the first half is an origin tale and it retells how all the characters came into play how they became friends and how they formed the mystery inc so you learn how shaggy scooby fred thelma and daphne come together to form their friendship and actually you get to see their first uh, mystery solved as kids the first half being an origin story it it does uh actually take away from the the color and the pizzazz of what the property is known for because by modernizing it it does take a use heavy reliance on gimmicky storytelling 
So basically what I mean by that is that there's a lot of pop culture references, a lot of slapstick comedy. Putting aside my likes for slapstick comedy, the issue I had with it, it wasn't the comedy itself. It was the fact the reliance was on that was on the comedy and the pop culture references and it took away from the actual property even with all that fragmentation and all that reliance on uh, tropes and archetypes scooby and shaggy their relationship in the beginning there's a very point in endearing moments between them that bring them together and also keeps the the whole first half glued together and you're like you want to see what happens with them in the latter half when it moves into the second half it introduces a lot more nostalgia then people might not have noticed and they did a good job of hiding a lot of the nostalgia from the trailers other than the obvious ones even with all that nostalgia by returning the the mystery element from the show into the second half it actually brings back an, an enjoyment style like adventure it's kind of missing from the show the show has a very beat by beat kind of telling they have a mystery they have all the clues you have Sh uh, scooby and shaggy doing all their frolicking and fumbling all over the place and you do have that there's a feeling of adventure and there's a journey a true journey of self-discovery in this film that is you never seen in any of the previous iterations of this of this property there's a challenge to everybody's friendship in this film and i think that actually adds a little more heart it leads into a very a point kind of uh climax even though there was a lot of familiarity with the action sequences and stuff that references the cartoon but overall it does travel into a second half that does end on a higher note than how it started off what say you uh, scuba i absolutely loved it this movie tries to sit there and bring back Hanna barbera and bring it yeah. in as kind of a shared universe granted their big thing they did was scooby-doo and the inclusion of so many other nods and references not just to scooby-doo but Hanna also to yeah. Hanna Barbera as a whole, uh, yeah. it bringing in Blue Falcon, bringing in Captain Caveman, and Dick Dastardly being the being the uh, villain. I mean, he is the. We're layering in the other Hanna Barbera properties and the story for Scooby Doo. It takes it beyond just these cheesy criminals in costumes to a yeah. serious kind of world event that could be impacting yeah that that part of the film i did enjoy like that whole point where you get all the Hanna barbera references i i noticed most of them not all of them just because i was engrossed in uh, scooby and shaggy's like a fractured relationship you've never seen their relationship hit a crossroads like that even and even though when at points it does seem rushed there's enough a uh, dynamic between the two that was formed in the first half where you see that self-discovery along with them trying to prevent this uh um catastrophe and then you're finding out the heritage of scooby-doo uh, with a lot of the other stuff coming around it keeps it centralized going uh, going straight forward which i enjoyed especially in the second half it's the first half that kind of was disjointed and there was a lot of stuff in the first half that kind of turned me off it had a turning point in the bowling alley once they got to the bowling alley that's when the film i think kicked <sighs> in for me the story i didn't have much of a problem with i i I, I felt that one, probably one of the characters that has the hardest time updating in every iteration is Freddy. You know, I was about to, you read my mind because you can tell that he was kind of out of place, but not to the point that it distracted, but you knew it was, they were trying to update it, but it would, he, it was just, they, they couldn't really find that niche. So I like that they kept him not too, too much, not too much in the main plot. So if they would have had him more focused in there, they might have distracted from everything else. But they did a good job of hiding his flaws. Fred always is the one that seems like he comes off the the least able to be upgraded. I mean, you ha Velma's easy because Velma's the brains of the outfit. Yeah. And Scooby and Shaggy, of course, are like the lovable idiots. Yeah, and that that that's a trope that's used all over the place, so that's not hard to upgrade. Yeah, <laughs> it's very self-aware in the fact that Scooby and Shaggy are the lovable idiots, because it's like yeah. this is such a good film, in my opinion, as far as a kids' yeah. film that adults yeah. can enjoy, especially adults who are of the generation that they mm -hmm. watched classic Scooby Doo as well as the newer stuff. Because I remember being a kid when a pup named Scooby Doo came out. I think it's a great. I think it's a great movie. I per. Uh, what was your rating for it? 
Um, well, overall, uh, I think the movie, it, it had a lot of highs and lows and it, it did enough to where, like you said, it could, it's a good family fun movie. Uh, the kids would enjoy it. People that are, are are fans of the property would definitely enjoy it. But there was just um, there was just a lot of stuff in the first half that took away from the overall enjoyment. I think that there, there was a lot of gimmicky storytelling, mostly in the first half, but it does happen throughout. But there's enough in the second half to redeem it. So I think overall it is worth watching at home as a, like a Friday night rental. So 2.5 out of 5. And this one I'm actually going to give it a 3, 3.5. Three just... Yeah. The gimmicky storytelling is some of the yeah. classic way of Hanna Barbera cartoons. Yeah, some of it, like I I enjoy some gimmicky, but I think there was a little too much too much reliance on it. Not the references or the nostalgia. There's the other like pop culture gimmicky stuff that just took away from it. There is still enough there to enjoy, so that's I, why it's still a good time. I think it's still you can still have a fun time. But Scooby enjoyed it. State of game, point where we talk about the various games we were playing and how we are playing them. What's up and serve, my man? What's up? Serve? Oh, no. I'm um, moving my way through. Um, um, it wasn't too much gaming this weekend because, like I said, the the day, you know, the day was nice. It's opening up. So I was like, I'm going to venture out. But I did get in gaming. I always get in some time for gaming. So I went and ventured a little bit further into Final Fantasy um moved into the next chapter and working my way through to the end um i'm in chapter 14 there's 18 chapters so i only have like a few more left so and the story is getting really good and you're starting to it's starting to reveal the truth and the connections of Aerith to everything else and what she is i mean anybody that's you know played final fantasy 7 you know but you know playing through it again it's just the way they have incorporated and expanded this section of the game is just stupendous so and the combat is just surreal mm -hmm. because you really have to be on your toes because the enemy types vary constantly what difficulty so, are you doing this on right now um i'm doing it in normal i think that the nor the regular mode okay uh, so but it's just um it's just so fast paced and the the freneticism of the combat is uh it you have to have good hand eye coordination you got to know how to balance your your mana and your health potions and all the other different skill sets that you have and the balance between all your people and your party is so great so it's like a, i the more i play the more i feel like what they did was just evolve the idea of what a jrpg is because you know everybody knows traditional jrpg is turn based but it seems like they just kind of like okay let's take that idea but just kind of mold it into, you know, JRPG 2.0 because the action, I mean, it's, it's action based, but you can flip between the characters constantly, but you got to be smart. You got to dodge, you got to weave, you got to block, uh, you know, and parry. And depending on the enemy types, depends on which character in the party is better fit. So it could be Barrett, it could be Tifa, it could be Cloud. I always use Cloud for everything. He's just great, but um, it's just, it's just a fun time and the story is engrossing. And I just look forward to reaching the final chapters and um, hopefully uh, they make a, a, a part two sooner than later. <laughs> well, it should be. I think all of them are pretty much, it's just some fine tuning, which is why it's split out. Oh, yeah. But you could tell why they didn't make this one game because this game itself is big. And if they if they put it all together, it might have been as and big as this is as just a, Midgar. Yeah, this is just Midgard. This is just Midgar. Yeah. This is just yeah. the first part of Midgar. This isn't the, how the thing ends. Oh, yeah. There's still so, all of that world traveling and finding uh, Sid and the re and Vincent and all the rest of them. It's like, that's got to be some be some massive stuff. I mean, if they just oh, took yeah. this little bit that was Midgar and made it so epic in scope comparatively, it's like, all right, this is a good bar that you're setting. I hope they don't trip and fall. Well, you can only hope, but if they took if they took this care with they were able to expand a part of the game that really didn't have a lot of fleshed out stuff originally, just imagine what they can do with the latter half. Oh yeah, just, yeah, yeah, totally. It's, it's just insane. Totally, hundred and ten percent on that, my man. But if I remember correctly, uh, uh, Square Enix said they they were only making it's going to be a three parter, so it depends on which which one of the next two are going to be the bigger bulk. Either the second one or the third one. Who knows? Uh, the third one's got a high enough bar to set because that's the whole battle with Sephiroth and stuff. Yeah. 
Second one is a lot of world exploration. I'm betting yeah. the second one's a lot of world exploration. And then we're going to get in. I mean, you may introduce one or two more companion characters. Yeah. And save the save the last one, the last last one or two for the the third one or you introduce the rest of your companion and then the third one is just chasing Sephiroth. Oh yeah. So it might it might it might the th- my 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 hypothesis is that the next next chapter or saga might be a Witcher three style, you know, just because of the world building, and the expansions. So, you know, because if you know Witcher three, it's so big and massive. That's what you can think of, um, what the second part could be, and then the last part is just chasing Sephiroth. So, Sephiroth. But yep. Uh, other than Final Fantasy VII, I was like, let me go and try another game that I had, which on Xbox, which is a Kingdom Come Deliverance. So I kind of played, a, it's an open world medieval game. Okay. So um, there's no magic in it. It's all uh, built upon, you know, action and combat. And I played just a, just a, a few minutes of it. And I can tell I'm, I'm going to, it's going to be an adjustment because the combat is very meticulous. Are we like talking like Dark Souls with swords, meticulous or... What's that? Are we talking like it's Dark Souls meticulous? No, no, no. Meticulous as in you have to be smart in your combat. It's not just press a button in your fight. Like the way you fight, you have to swing here, here, here. It tells you how to swing, but you got to be able to swing and swing fast to counter because the enemy type will counter you. So you got to recounter on his. But it's a little more fluid and a little more realistic because it's hand to hand combat in first person. Okay. So, Cool. So I, I haven't played too much of it. I just wanted to just venture in and test the waters with a different game. But probably I will venture off in another game um, on the PS4. So uh, probably venture in Days Gone until it goes to Tsushima comes out. Because every time I see that, uh, I get a little bit more excited. So I don't have a, I don't really have anything video game wise. Unfortunately, not all of my games went off. This weekend, the uh, no the no quarter game had to be postponed a week. Challenge accepted, on the other hand, was a uh, party makes it to their haunted house. They came to investigate, and they started to explore the gardens. This party has human or half elf, a human, and two gnomes right now. That's it. Well, one of the gnomes is inspecting the brush and comes across a den with four giant weasels, and the weasels yeah. are like, hmm gnome a delicacy so they attack and they try and drag the gnomes into the burrow <laughs> the party survives a little worse for wear in the end but the party survives i think the clutch move is the uh when one of the weasels had uh the the pant leg of a gnome was dragging him back to the burrow um the hu- the one of the other party members casts uh prestidigitation which is a spell that allows you to like do simple things like change something sight smell test that kind of thing and it's like all right well i want to make i want to use this and have his pant leg taste like a hot pepper and i was like that's interesting okay okay so Spicy. then i then yeah. i then i then i put the trick on him it's like what kind of hot pepper because the and this was what the, i used this as a methodology to determine the difficulty challenge or the dc yeah of the wheat for the weasel whether or not they would ignore the taste or react to the taste so i was like what is are we talking like a habanero are we talking like a jalapeno or are we talking worse he's like worse much much worse like the worst like <laughs> Okay, I couldn't remember the name at the time, but I did look it up when I was writing up my notes. Yeah. And it happens to be the uh, Carolina Reaper. Is Carolina the, Reaper. That is that is the one that is in the Guinness World Record for being the hottest pepper. I don't even know why anybody would try it, but go for it, I guess. Well, it worked. Weasel failed, and the guy and the uh, gnome was released. And so it was like, that was probably one of the more creative things I've ever heard a player do mm-hmm. in a game. And I, I, I loved it. Um, they cur- they got beat up pretty good. So they decided to hold up in one of the rooms in this haunted house. And ne- this week we're going to continue their investigation. 
and see if they can get through the house without making too much racket. But uh, that game went pretty well. Um, I spent okay. a, quite a bit of time doing prep for it, working on my prep, using uh, D&D Beyond for the encounter builder and researching. Uh, one of the big... Uh, Big ones I was researching and setting up was for the uh, A team game on Sunday. Them, I it's, they've been, I, I've been having a problem with them in the fact that okay they are just up in the north and they I got to get them south, and my methodology for handling travel has been okay. We cycle through random encounter options, but it could take forever. It started to feel like a slog, and it didn't feel very fun. So doing some research on dungeon on some skills and stuff, I can't. I, I I took the suggestion of making a skill challenge for the travel. Okay. Well, the party I had put them in a ma the, La the Luskin, which is the major city before the north. This city has you have three modes of travel to get places. You okay. can go by air, you can go by land, or you can go by sea. So I I, I looked up and I rigged up a set of. Uh, skill challenges based on each of those modes of travel and how long each mode of travel would take. That one took probably the most prep. I, know, I think I spent all, I pretty much spent an, an entire day researching and trying to figure out the skill challenge. And I ended up having two, not just did I do the skill challenges, but I also rigged up a couple of encounters on the encounter table where in the city. And if the party happened to come across it, there could have been a major element in there. They didn't come across it, so now it's just going to sit in the toolbox for another day or potentially another party. Um, and that's kind of how that's how air, that's how they went. So now they're in Waterdeep. They're going to start doing the Dungeon of the Mad Mage next time, and I believe we're barring any craziness. I think we're all going to be around the table for our next session. I'm really missing being around the table with people. I realize I have some groups and new friends that the yeah. only way we're going to get around the table is virtually unless they fly in or we happen to meet somewhere. But uh, case in point, we did our second episode of the Pigeons of Zadash, which was mm -hmm. the uh, birthday one shot I was invited to. Yeah, It did not disappoint. We completed the adventure. And okay. it opened the door for us to go in other places. We had to get the spoon... To this balcony to try and help the guy well of course we have this group of adventurers who up until today that day had been a flock of pigeons so there's a learning thing in there and um he had, the dungeon master had said that it's like we we just took that whole pigeon role play and just ran with it um and got figured a way up there and defeated the boss and was given the option to either return to being pigeons or stay mm -hmm. as adventurers and go on adventures. We decided to stay as adventurers and the uh, protagonist like, all right, well, I've got to go now. So as he disappears, we're standing there going, wow, this is, that was a lot of fun. And there's a bunch of guards coming up behind us. Cause you know, we um, killed some acolytes yeah. and uh, stole some clothes and some books and made a lot of ruckus. And yeah, you're a mark man. It's, it's kind of one of those, it, it ended on a cliffhanger, but it's that, hmm. <laughs> to be continued, maybe. Dot, you know. dot, dot, question mark? Uh, I don't know. We'll see and what I happens. Never saw the end again. Yeah. State of game. A lot of D&D &D fun. With that, I guess we can kind of roll into our news and odds and ends. Talking about the news. All right. Yeah. Giggity, giggity. All righty. We got a few stories here on news. Let's see. Yeah, a few good, uh, few, you know, a uh, good variety of stories to talk about. Oh, yeah. We all, just like we did last time, we got a few stories that are newsy, and then we got a bunch that are just, these are, comparatively, these are kind of just out there. <laughs> They're kind of great. I did. I, 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 they I are great. I've got a couple yeah. of great ones, a couple of YouTube video references. Notes will be in the, uh, in the great nerd stuff. Yeah. Good All job, right. Brian. Let's uh, start yeah. with one that I think is, I actually think this is really cool. I'm not a big sports person. Anybody who knows me, I'm not big into sports. I don't, I, I yes, I'm a Seahawks person because I lived in Seattle and I 
And I really like the team. I like the team's history, but Rye being the cheese head. Cheese head, you know, Packers galore. You don't yep. see, but there's a poster of the Super Bowl winning year on my wall over here too. So. Which one? The first one? Uh, No, the back, one back in uh, 2010. Okay. So. But yeah, I mean, you, I don't, I, the extent of my Seahawks stuff is a couple of stickers, a couple of little yeah. koozies and a towel I keep in my bowling bag. Unlike you, who probably has the has the market cornered on at least one of every cheesehead item that's been made. As I look around my room, probably you know, <laughs> there's a lot of there's a lot of pack of memorabilia around here. So, but yeah, I'm not. Yeah. Bottom line, I'm not a big sports person. I'm not. I don't yeah. follow a lot of teams. I don't get all stuck up in the nitty gritty. As such, networks like ESPN and those things don't really appeal to me unless I'm like at the barbershop or whatever and see they have ESPN up. I'll watch it then. Other than that, I really yeah. don't. Or at the gym when they have it on the half the TVs there. All of this rambling like a rambling man. Let me get to the point. Point is with this uh, COVID-19 stuff, everything's been kind of locked down. Virtually every sport has gone. Nope. We're going to stay at home until yeah. someday in unknown future, which those are the kinds of things that these sport networks kind of rely on in order to exist. If there's no sports being played, who's going to watch a sports network? I think ESPN found a good way to adapt because that's the big thing. We have to adapt in this society, in this world we live in now. Very and that adaptation good. is they did a docu-series called The Last Dance. But I think that saved the network throughout this whole COVID-19 as far as viewership. It's probably did i don't think it would uh, i mean even if they didn't play it they wouldn't uh, die, die straight because uh the one thing that espn does have i mean of, of course you go to espn they're the worldwide leader in sports because you want to go and watch sports you know football basketball baseball hockey mma you you name it they'll go and put it on display but what they did here with the last dance is um one of the things that ESPN is known for is their documentaries. So you have the 30 for 30, and then you have, you know, other ones that they do. But The Last Dance focuses on Michael Jordan and the Bulls during the 90s. I yeah, mean, this was a series that was originally supposed to air later this year, but they decided to air it early, right? Oh, yeah. They they moved it from June uh, to April. Um, it's a 10-episode run. My bad. A 10-episode run, and they were going to do it in June. But because of this whole situation and not having anything to play, they moved it up to April, and it probably um, helped ESPN a lot, especially from CNN Business. It's reported it reported that the docu series The Last Dance is the most uh, highest rated and most watched uh, documentary series ever by ESPN, which is a boon for them. It's a greatness, and it shows the nail in the noggin with this one because not only did they find something to fill in the void for sports, but they used a documentary that has been long rumored and long hidden hidden away that nobody thought they'd ever get to see, which was actually seeing the other side of the Bulls dynasty, seeing the my, uh, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen relationship. And then, you know, their relationship with the team, how, how Jordan got to be who he is today, the icon. And you get to see a lot of that stuff behind the scenes. And you see that it just didn't come to him. He worked to get to that spot. Oh yeah. He worked. Yeah. Definitely, so, he's definitely one of the hardest work, hard, hardest working people I, I, I've heard of. Oh yeah. So as uh, reported on CNN uh, Business, quote: the series, which debuted to big numbers in April, averaged 5.6 million viewers throughout the run. End quote. So that's a really good number for a cable network, especially a cable network that strictly runs live sports. So. Yeah, and there's only so many different reruns of past games that you can play before people are like. I saw this. Or they have yeah, their can, Captain America moment. It's like, yeah, I know that game. game. I was there. Say that again. Said so I could watch the Packers win the Super Bowl every day. That's fine by me. And I would not have the 10 panic attacks that I did when I actually watched it live. But, you know, it might change. Who mm, knows? I might know. have 12. You could always pretend it's the first time you're seeing it. Then I would die. <laughs> But it's, right. this is a, this is a series I'm definitely going to catch. I actually I didn't watch it in its run because I wanted to watch it when it dropped all of them at once. Mm -hmm. So now that it's finished, I'm going to go back and start watching them, and then okay. probably have a review on Scuba and the Rye. Check later in the year. Oh yeah, look forward to talking about it. Alrighty, yeah. our next uh, newsy thing, which is again relating to the current pandemic and the, some of the 
interesting anecdotes that come from that. And that is video game spending for the first quarter of 2020 is the highest in, was it's at its highest in U.S. history. Gee, who didn't see that coming? Well, um, I guess you would be hiding under a rock if you didn't think video game sales would skyrocket, especially during uh, uh, this kind of pandemic. Um, so where, you know, it's predicated on isolation. You're staying home. You have to entertain yourself. So well, it's not just entertaining yourself. It's any all, all, all the millions of people who have children that are in school that are not in school anymore and have to do something with them. I was... I was listening to uh, one of the various shows I follow for on D and D Beyond, where they talked about they had a whole episode on mental health, and it was a group of psychiatrists who coincidentally play D and D. They have a game called Clinical Role, <laughs> and they were talking about the whole thing with that. And one of them has little kids, and they, it's like they actually plug their Wii back in, and we're doing that with the kids, and and. The, all of these casual games are being played and uh, side stories of these various game sales and like companies like uh, Epic Games doing refunds for if your game goes on sale a few days after you bought it at retail. Yeah, and a lot of the a lot of the streaming are um, a lot of the like Xbox Game Pass and then Sony, they're dropping even more free games each month to get people, you know, to play their games. Yeah, I mean, uh, how many different how many different stories have we talked about this the so far this spring? Because we're getting going from spring into summer. How many times during the spring we've talked about various companies that are like, hey, here of this for free, here of that for free. Here's these game deals. Yeah, every every uh, every uh, every podcast since the pandemic, there's all at least been one new story we talked about where Ubisoft is dropping Assassin's Creed for free, or Sony's releasing the Uncharted ter- uh, you know Uncharted series for free, or. Xbox is pushing all these games out for free. It's or just, it's a just, tabletop uh, side, D&D Beyond releasing modules for free, Roll20, Fantasy Grounds, all having modules for free for you to use for X amount of time, expanding what they've been working on. And in some cases, it's been a boon for them because they have more usability to test and see where their, flo- where their holes are and make developmental improvements and fast track certain things that were originally slated for weeks if not months of development now they can fast track it and get it out oh yeah and definitely with this uh the, the plus side we're seeing this video game sales reach uh, a higher number it's definitely allowing an expansion of the indie market so there's probably a lot of games that people would have not seen if they didn't have the time to look and venture out in the nintendo e-store or the you know xbox game pass or pony uh playstation's um a ps plus they'll see oh wait there are this many variety out there Oh, no. let's not let let's not let's not ignore let's not ignore that one group that sad and will harass us about if we don't mention it at least once, and that is the Steam market and the whole PC master race. Oh yeah, yeah, PC and master all race. All of those Steam, potential they've games. They've always there. had a, a grip on sales, but this is like gold for them right now. This is this is prime gold to get those games on Steam, and Steam is like being uh, sneaky with their sales and. You know, hey, let's get these like forty games for four bucks. You know, kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Did I log into Steam or log into Humble Bundle? I just can't figure it out. I'm getting so many games for so you little never money. Know. You but never know. But the whole thing with it, and it's all about marketing, keeping creativity, keeping things from this whole isolation attitude. Oh, yeah. And the one thing with creativity, especially with games now and the different ways you can interact and purchase and play, there's a lot of variety and escapes you can do. And the article, which is on IGN, it's reported that in the first quarter, the record, um, quote, driven by digital content spending across console, mobile, and PC platforms reached $10.86 billion in total from January to March. That is an increase of 9% compared to the same period of last year, end quote. Nice. So, which, yeah, yeah, I'd say that's pretty cool, and I, I have a feeling the summer will be just as big. Oh, Alrighty. Yeah. Oh, speaking yeah. of creativity and games, let's uh, that that transitions well, well, real well to our next story, which is Nintendo revealed another Paper Mario game. This is Paper oh, yeah. Mario: The Origami King, which is coming in July. Which I 
there was rumored there would be a new one this year, but I don't think anyone realized it would be in July. And another interesting tidbit is this is the 16th game. Oh yeah, so it is. It is uh, being reported like July 17th. Uh, another Paper Mario is coming out, and it's it's another one of those like uh, I think could be one of those another surprise hits that Nintendo has been doing. Uh, especially on their switch uh device like they'll be just kind of just going along with their indie games and some titles and then like oh yeah here's this nice surprise and then people are like what uh so not only did uh, uh nintendo strike it out the park with animal crossing at the beginning of this year which played into the video game sales uh they're about to drop paper mario which is going to be another boon for them because there's a lot of fans of that that property well, i mean mario is one of those franchises that prints money Oh yeah. I mean, Paper Mario all you have to. I mean, money. what am I saying? Mario prints money, <laughs> so you know, it is definitely. It's definitely. It's going to uh, add another another rise and another reason to get the Switch, Scuba, and um, play with me, Scuba. You know. Tell you what, find somebody who'll don't who 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 don't who who'll send me a Switch to review and give my clinical opinion on or critical okay. opinion, whatever or consumer opinion, whatever you want to call it. And, you know, we can work on that. Until then, yeah. I will wait until the opportune time to pick one up. Yeah, well, let's go see. I'll start a Kickstarter and see what happens. <laughs> Crowdfund it, yeah. yeah uh, you know what? Uh... Actually, you know what? You know how pe that could happen is you could support the show through some of our various support links down in the description below as well as in the panels here on Twitch. There is all there are several different ways you can contribute to the show if you like what we're doing and want us to and want us to keep doing it and to expand. Ch click those links, hit those buttons and you know support if you think that we're worth supporting. By all means, support my switch habit. Spend or support rise heckling of me for not having every game system on the planet. Yeah, it's it's a shame. But, you know, somebody's got to sacrifice to do it, and I will be the sacrifice. Uh -huh. All righty. All right. So, well, we've had all this good news. How about something that's not so good? Yeah, well, yeah, I don't think it's good for a, a streaming platform out there. Yeah. Not, not, not really. <laughs> well, yeah, this is probably the other half of that double-edged sword of everybody spending more time uh, consuming content because they've got really nothing else to do. And that is the oh, fact yeah. that Hulu is being hit with a class action lawsuit on the grounds that they are throttling their the quality of their stream to favor mobile devices over other devices. Oh yeah, and this is uh this is an interesting thing because it's all my it's already known that, you know, all the stream platforms have been asked to throttle back netflix was asked to throttle back in europe so they you know people could stream so it's kind of interesting to see this article come out on comicbook.com uh where a suit uh according uh quote according to the suit filed april 16th in the superior court of the state of california for the county of los angeles hulu allegedly throttles quality of on web-based browsers in an attempt to drive users to their mobile devices and quotes so it's very interesting that this claim is and seeing how it, is it is it really that bad that you want to watch on the go instead of watching on your computer? I'm just I mean, kind of curious. It's interesting to say the least. So Oh, awesome. Congrats, Saladin. Yeah, but, definitely. Uh, that's a positive. Uh, at least there's no lawsuit against you and your streaming platforms. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> yeah, he was uh, he was talking about that the other day, and it's like, yeah, that's pretty much pretty, when he was telling me how that interview process was going. I got to be honest, I it was pretty. I pretty much knew he was going to get an offer. Oh yeah, uh, 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 Saladin and, and his expertise. It wouldn't take them too long. So congrats there, Saladin. No, definitely much, much, much love to you, my man. Congrats. All right, so yeah, well, back to suing people. Well, <laughs> uh, what, do about, uh, what do you think about this class action lawsuit that's going against Sahulu? You know, I can't say I'm overly surprised. Because this was filed on behalf of 
a group out of a office in California. So this kind of feels like a lot of other things. Uh, regard, regardless, I don't think I don't think it's fair that you have to that you throttle one in favor of the other. That's that whole that goes back to that whole business about net neutrality and all of the hubbub over that. But I think that yet this is yet another one of those things. It's like I'm a lawyer. I'm young. I want to make a name for myself. I'm bored. I'm going to go after these people for because of this, that, and the other. And that kind of thing just really irks me on how many, th how many times it's been things that weren't really broken. Oh yeah. All of a sudden need to be fixed because there's this influx of, of people trying to make tr in some case, in some, the argument can be made making trouble where there, there is no need to be trouble. Oh yeah, so, there's there's no need to be troubled, and I meant like yeah, it could be um some a mixture of false advertising on streaming quality, but at the same time, Hulu's on various platforms. You know, not only do you can watch in your browser and your mobile devices, you have all the smart TVs, you have the Fire Sticks, the Chromecast, you have a lot of ways that streaming services are played. So, um, it you gotta have a stronger basis of claim in here. And the one thing that this article points out, this has been evidence for more than over a year where it's been multiple users reported poor quality through browsers instead of using the other means for uh, watching so it's it's a, little, it's a catch-22 i mean like if they want to throttle in certain ways and go the other i guess it's a matter of matter of choice at times but if you're you know false advertising on the quality like you're going to have high quality across the board but you don't then you got to uh, put your bean and beans in the hat and see what happens. It does have a quote in here where Hula does apologize for not being able to, uh, you know, deliver high definition streaming on the website all the time. So we'll see what happens. Interesting. Alrighty. Well, that's the uh, the newsy stuff. Now for getting into some of the more odd and comical. Odd and comical. The odds and ends. The segment odds that and we ends. talk about oddies and endies. Sometimes you know what, I think I'm going to rearrange the list here at last there. minute and save the top two for the end, because I think the top two are really cool, and I want to end on, end on a high note. And so uh, can, let's... Uh, soar, so... Yeah, let's uh, let's start from the bottom and work our way up this time. So those who okay. know... I, that, that sounds good for me. For those who know, I, I, I spent... Rye sends me articles throughout the week. Sometimes all the way up to like two minutes before we go live, he is sending me articles to look at. The hey, things are hey, just kind of hey, weird. Hey, hey. Some of them are last two minutes. kind of cool. Some of them are just like not really fitting the overall tone for the day. But he tend, there's some that are definitely are really kind of out there. Well, let's, let, let's start with this one, which is one of those ones he sent me at the last minute. And that is... Maryland Bar uses inner tube tables to properly social distance customers amid the pandemic. What? Oh, yeah. And this is another one, a testament to, uh, it's been a, a boon for our local news segment because we've been getting a lot of stuff from the local news segment. And this is another one reported on Wavy um, as, quote, uh, as a Maryland Bar is taking the safety of its customers seriously, but in a fun way. Uh, Fish Tails Bar and Grill in Ocean City bought bumper tables for customers to use once they reopen. Um, uh, yeah, there's that. It says here in the article on wavy.com, the idea is from Revolution Events Design and Production out of Baltimore. This is, they have the, 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 the image in the article, which the link will be in the description, of course, <laughs> is this checkerboard table that you stand in and one of those big inflatable tubes that you would normally be rolling down the rapids with is around you and you're kind of that way you cannot get too close to somebody oh yeah so you just walk around in this inner tube like a bunch of bumper cars while you're drinking so it's just a it's a mixture of fun disaster waiting to happen that's what mm -hmm. i call it fun disaster so oh, yeah i like it i like the idea and this is what you call uh, you know, adjusting to the new norm, you know, you got to evolve, even if it's kind of funny at the same time. All right. Our next story, and that is kind of a cool, a cool thing. 
and that is uh, bike sales gear up for as homebound try to socially distant exercise. Basically, this is a another one of those things. This probably could have gone in the earlier segment, but basically, because we're all stuck at home, ish. There's got to think about ways to keep active. And one of those things to keep active is getting out and exercising. And some localities have shut down streets and whatever to encourage people to get out and jog, walk, and ride bikes. I have heard, I've heard my wife talk numerous times on how the store she works in, there's like virtually no bikes left. Because oh, yeah. people are constantly uh, buying bikes. I mean, they can't even put them together fast enough if people are taking them out. Yeah, I would believe so. Especially in this area. This area is very has many amenities outside where you can uh, run, bike, uh, hike, uh, jog, uh, do backflips, whatever you want to do. But the one thing I have noticed since, you know, everything went shut down is um, the bikes. I have noticed a lot more people on bikes. So when I saw this article, which is on NPR, where it says bike sales are up, it didn't, I didn't really bat an eye because it's like, it. this is just uh, hitting the nail on the noggin. And it just proves the fact that, you know, um, if you, you know, give another uh you know give people another way out you know to do something they're going to go find a way out and their way out is getting a bike and going around which i think it's cool i mean this is probably one of those things is you know bikes have been one of those things that i think kind of been struggling and yeah. now not so much because people are trying to you know do different modes of transportation oh yeah all righty um this next one up is <laughs> i yeah, this is just wild man like um i don't know you do the intro on this one i've introduced everything i want to hear you talk about you intro this one all right so um we uh are your favorite uh neighborhood spider-man you know he likes to swing around everywhere he has these things called web shooters so he shoots out the webs you know so you can swing around well apparently according to this article on screen rant spider-man's web shooters are now hand sanitizers so um what has happened is that um, what has happened is that somebody has managed to make the web shooters that you known from the comics and made them into hand sanitizers. So, so instead of shooting out webs, they shoot out the the sanitizers into your hand. So you press the button, and there you go, clean hands. Wow. I mean, that's not geek culture. I don't know what else to tell you. I'm sorry. That is oh, just yeah. wild. So as a bit, as according to this article, quote, Inventions, Gadgets, and Gizmos uploaded a video onto their YouTube account that details a new product called Pum Hicks, which is described as a slick wristband that enables people to push a sliding button and spray sanitizers into their palms or at other surfaces with ease, end quote. I, I, I just think back to that old, to one of the old uh, toys for kids where you put like silly string cartridges in these web shooters now instead of silly string it's uh it's hand sanitizer that's uh, that's pretty cool you're swinging in the walls you're swinging into safety so you know well hey i mean you 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 have to wear a mask may as well have the web shooters oh yeah but the coolest thing i did see just uh just just a side note is uh speaking of coverings i saw somebody biking in the park with a boba Hett, a boba fett helmet Oh yeah. So gotta get creative. So there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm surprised there's not more stormtroopers walking around. Well, they would just miss along the way. So you know. All right. Next story. <laughs> do you you like being the, the switch Danny person, DeVito? you do this one too because. The, uh... And so my question is: Do you like Danny DeVito? Do you like uh, seeing his pretty face in shows and uh, TV and movies and you know everybody Young, knows younger him. Danny DeVito older Danny DeVito is a little you know off camera Danny DeVito is a little different but oh, yeah. you know on camera and stuff I mean he's a funny guy he's a, he's definitely had a wide, a wide breadth of characters and roles from twins to Batman Returns to um, was Sunny in Philadelphia the man's got a lot of different things he's done oh yeah he's done a lot of things he's been penguin he's been on a popular tv show and now he's in a popular video game as an island so in animal crossing you can go to uh, danny devito island uh to spend some time um farming and a lot of other things 
So that's what this uh, user in a Animal Crossing did. Uh, uh, Reddit user B4SS soon decided to do with their island was convert it into a massive photo of Danny DeVito. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Just, the, I, the, the screenshot, the, the screenshots are in this article. It is just okay. Because yeah. apparently in Animal Crossing, you can terraform your island to make it look how you want. And this guy spent the time to terraform his island to where at altitude, like a crop circle, you can see Danny DeVito. Oh, yeah. So you definitely can grow some turnips in, in the DeVito face way, I guess. Sprout up some uh, some genuine, tasty Danny things, I guess. I don't know. All righty. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let, 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 let's, let's take that away to uh, talking about cleanliness again. Super cleanliness, but in a robot-style fashion. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I will uh, drop that in there first. And that is... We all we we've heard of the Roomba. We all can make jokes about the Roomba, cats riding around on Roombas and that thing. But this is a guy who took his love for Star Wars, and a Roomba, and a trash can, and made the droid. That is a very R two like. It's an R two unit style droid, only it was built in materials light enough to where the room where the where a budget friendly robot vacuum could pull him along and still clean and then use and he rigged it up with a bluetooth speakers a portable battery pack he sat the downside is he can't is the robot can no longer get to every place it used to be able to get but the trade-off of having a star wars droid roaming around your house cleaning the floor i'd say is pretty priceless Yes, it is priceless. It is. I would give up. Uh, I would give up to get that because you know I could watch R two D two clean my house all day and just be happy. That's clever. There's a YouTube video along with this where the guy goes through some of the goes through some of the construction, or whatever. It's very light, and it's just, it's like he started with like a plastic. Tr it's like you have the Roomba or the robot. You have a plastic trash can. You have an oscillating fan motor. At least the part where it winds left to right. Uh, Bluetooth speakers, paint, a couple of light, some light wood material to make the legs, and some casters, and you have got uh, R2, an R2 unit cleaning your house, which is, I think, is pretty cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let the robot work. He's got to make some money. The movies are done, so. All right, our last, our last thing to talk about tonight, and this is not going to take a lot. And that is uh, another Star Wars uh, story. And this one is a Star Wars mashup. Uh, yeah. we've, all, we, we've seen lately there's been a lot of things like when Guardians of the Galaxy came out, they recut the Star Wars trailers to fit the song for Guardians of the Galaxy's first trailer. Yeah. There, there's all been all these things. Well, this is a guy, this is some, somebody who took the theme song to top gun which if we everybody's watched the movie that opening credit scene where the jet or where the jets are flying and you're here in danger zone by kenny loggins somebody took that song and that theme and managed to cut together all of the x-wing fighter scenes from the entire skywalker saga to that set to that song and i've just for me, it's all about the feels because I really enjoy Kenny Loggins. I really enjoy that soundtrack. It's probably one of my favorite soundtracks of uh, uh, ever, especially yeah, the Danger Zone song. You just you just get, gotta get hyped for that. Yeah, and it's a song that you know if you cut that song perfectly, it just makes any scene great. And then uh, this uh, this uh, fan of Star Wars, Jackson McKay, is reported on Screen It. He was thinking about Top Gun with certain aerial sequences with the X-Wing fighters and decided, hey, he brilliantly put together both all the aerial sequences from the movies to that song. And like I mentioned to you in the pre-show, like watching this, you know, he knew precisely which scenes to use at which part of the song. He perfectly cut 
all the X-Wing scenes to match the veracity of the song from yeah, beginning so, uh, Definitely. You should go check check that out on YouTube. Link's in the chat right now for you. Um, link will be in the description in the show notes, uh, appropriately speaking. Um, but that's a great way to end it out is uh, going to the danger zone. Go to the danger zone. Yes, so, sir. With with that, we'll go ahead and start winding down. Uh, before we shift over for our credits and stuff, got to remind people that we have merch, got stickers, coffee got cups. Hi. Did they actually sent me the good coffee cup? It does. Uh, see. Yeah, it's, it's a good one. It's oriented right for our contact info. Which every this is where you can find us on all the social medias. Uh, what not. Uh, Rye, you got anything you want to close out with, my man? No, just uh, safe travels out there as um, as the states begin to open up. I know it's exciting to get back there, but uh, be safe. Um, this is a virus, so it is a virus that kills. But other than that, stay safe, stay swimming, stay diving. And with that, have a good week. Peace. Peace, people. Into the danger zone.